Fish. You're listening to the Rock and Roll Coup d'etat. My name's Eddie Winters. I've got Rajiv Da. Rajiv. Hello, Eddie. We've, we've got a very special guest on the line. Yeah. Let's... Let's, let's all put our hands together, Rajiv. Super We've got excited. Burley Drummond calling from down in Los Angeles, California. Burley, hey, welcome to the program. It is a pleasure to have you on the program. Well, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Raj. It's oh, great thank to be you. Here. What's happening? It is, it, is, it is great. We have been listening to Ambrose all morning. <laughs> uh, just getting deep, going That's into the catalog, going out of the catalog. That's amazing to hear, Mama Frog. Oh, yes. By the way, I mean, we were talking about this just right off the bat. Such a... I, I, love, I love those early records with that... With the... the, 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 the uh, Say it, I guess, Prague sound. Yeah. It, is, it is sensational. I love that. No, oh, thanks. Well, we were really influenced by, you know, King, King Crimson uh -huh. and, uh, and, you know, Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer and all those bands. So that was kind of uh, our, our response to that early stimulus of prog music coming out of England. So. So it's such a, I mean, it's such a, you guys also being an American prog band. So there's not many, many of those that, that, that got to do yeah, what you guys true. were yeah. doing. Yeah, we were we were America's little answer to an uh, English prog band, you know. But then, of course, you always had Zappa there. So, oh, know, yes. Zappa, Zappa is the godfather of, of it all. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Is it right, though, 2014, is is this the 44th year of Ambrosia? You're right. Yeah, absolutely. You're right on. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yes. I should. But, you know, pe people wonder, you know, why, how we, how come we look so good, you know? I, you know, that was my second question. <laughs> you do look really good. <laughs> I was well, going to say. We, yeah. we did start when we were three years old. That's right. <laughs> when we were three years old. That is really, you know, it's, it's I was going to ask you, I mean, it's, I mean, you guys started, I guess, 1970, and you've, yeah. And you're, you're still playing to get, uh, today three of the uh, original four members in the group. Yes. And, so. I mean, obviously you guys have had some breaks here and there, solo projects and and whatnot. But how do you, how, what's the secret to keeping a band together that long? Well, you know, I mean, in some senses, we we feel like we, we finally learned how to play the music. So it's, um, it's, it's fulfilling to us to play the music and, and expand on it. Uh, you know, and watch it develop, you know, beyond what it was when it was in the 70s. So it's a continuing, evolving, growing thing. And, uh, and we still, we, uh, we still love it because, I mean, we don't, we're not on a bus, you know, nine months out of the year. So mm -hmm. it's not like we burn out every time we, every time we get together. And we do about right now, 50 shows a year. So it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a reunion. It's like a family reunion right. for us. And, yeah. and, we, and we still, enjoy it now we're turning up the heat a little bit we're, we're starting to record a new album so uh that'll be the first time in a long time that we've we've come together to create we have new songs out there that we're playing live but you know to actually document them in a final version that's going to be interesting and when, when uh when did you guys start this the the the, the recording of the new record well so we're, we're, a, we're a couple months into it we have a couple tracks down and uh, you know, we're going to push to try to get it done this year. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like we're, you know, 17 and living in the same house, you know, like we used to. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we know we all have, you know, families and obligations and other projects and stuff. So, you know, Ambrosia, but Ambrosia is starting to become the priority again. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what new life comes into Ambrosia. You know, that'd be a great idea for a reality TV show is to get you guys to move into a house together <laughs> and just just do one record for the, just like the I old days. Know, yeah, we, we have a history of destroying houses. <laughs> oh, yeah. As, so. It'd be written into the budget. I, I can just <laughs> yeah, see it. That's right. I can see that. Yeah. So you guys yeah. you guys have some, you have a show coming up in two days here at Studio City. Is that right? At the Sportsman's yeah. Lodge? Well, we're just doing uh, with the, we're just doing a, tri uh, a benefit to help some friends out of ours, uh, McCrary uh, Gospel Group, uh, and it's, it's fun. But it's not like I wouldn't call it a full-on show. We're sure. just doing like a half-hour songs, and it's a benefit to raise money. But then Saturday we go to Arlington, Texas, right? And we play the Levitt Pavilion, which is about four thousand people. So. 
That's that'll, incredible. That'll be a full. That'll be a full show. And yeah. I, I see you guys. Are, you're doing uh, the Arcada in a uh, theater in St. Charles, Illinois, uh, uh-huh. later on in September. Which that yeah. I'm sure that's going to be a great show. Oh yeah, that'll be fun. And I think that's that's with Firefall and I'm not sure. It might be Poco. I'm not sure who. Uh, so that'll be kind of like a. That'll be a little bit like you know the old English shows when they had the, the variety shows yes. where they had. So I mean I think we each do like a half hour. So very uh, cool. Yeah, I, I'm on those kind of shows. I always want to do. I want to go up there and do a half hour of songs they've never heard. Of course, but <laughs> but it doesn't usually work out that way. In, in those kind of shows, is that do you have to mainly stick to the to the big hits? Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's yeah. kind of a hit parade thing. Sure. But, uh, which is all fine, you know, but that's what's that's kind of what keeps the ambrosia interesting for us is that you know we we can do that we can do a half hour of the hits, but we can also you know play a prog festival where they ask us to play everything but the hits right you know mm-hmm. right right <laughs> yeah they said we want you to play our festival just don't play the hits it's it's you know it's interesting it's interesting to think because you guys I mean that the first two records kind of you know defined you at that time as this band that was yeah. I mean you were touring with Rush you yeah. were you were associated in those groupings you know those, those groups yeah. and then to have such a um, I don't know a, a, just a, such a large you know hit on the third record that transforms you sh- you know to a different audience yeah. how, did, how did you keep that the balance or well, did you it, it- well, maybe not. I mean, uh, what's interesting about it is, I mean, we uh, we appreciated the prog, but we didn't label ourselves as a prog band. We just we were all about writing songs and and made the best song win. You know, mm-hmm. that's what we were about. In, in some respect, we kind of took after the Beatles. You know, we were thinking, well, the, you know, they they do the gamut. They would do Rain, and then they would do uh, you know a, a little love song and. And so we kind of, we kind of, in our naivety, thought, well, you know, we could, we can do anything. Let's just let the best song, uh, you know, make its way. And so when "How Much I Feel" came along, and this, there's a whole backstory to that too. But when that came along, it wasn't like uh, we were into, you know, trying to make it the best, uh, you know, rendition that we could of that song. We realized that the song was good. There was some discussion like, okay, you know, this isn't what we've been doing, but in a sense, we've been playing this while well, doing our first two records. Every night, we played this female dyke bar that was a block down the street to make to make a living. <laughs> right. You know, while we were recording, and that's all we played was R and B every night. So, in a sense, all that stuff was kind of, you know, incubating and in, inside. It was, of it was your hamburg. That if was you your, will. yeah, your cavern club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it it, it, it kind of was. So, uh, so the band does have a very strong R and B under underbelly to it. Yeah. Uh, although we do, we do, you know, in our heads we kind of favor the uh, the prog and the and the more adventurous stuff. We can we cannot deny that the R and B is lying inside our, us, and once in a while it comes out with biggest part of me and. How much I feel and right. things like that. So let me let me ask you. When let's go back, and I, I want to ask you know when you were coming up as a child, way before Ambrosia, uh-huh. was was the drums was the drums the first instrument that you gravitated to? And uh, well, I have was kind of an interesting. I mean, I'm an army brat, so I grew up in Turkey. You know, when I was a uh, you know nine, you know seven through eleven. And I remember going to a bazaar with my mom, uh, and getting lo- you know, getting separated. Sure. I was pretty young, like seven or so, and I wandered into the back of this tent, and there was these, you know, five or six guys in a circle hammering the big copper plates, you know, the huge copper right. plates, and they had such synchronicity going, and uh, and just the I was mesmerized. I think my mom told me that I was lost, you know, that I was gone for a you couple were lost of hours. In the rhythm. I just stood there in a trance, right? Just fixed by, and that was kind of like that the awakening for me. I mean, I didn't know what to do with it yet, but something happened. That was the, like the defining moment for you, for me. Yes, I mean, and then you know, I, I tried everything. I tried accordion, clarinet, you, trumpet, you named it, but you know, I could never really get the the rhythmic thing out of my head. 
Right. And uh, so that's I finally found found the drums and destroyed my neighbor's toy drum set and then <laughs> finally had to get one. Yes. What what age did you, what were you when when you got your first set? So I think I, I probably started in in like the sixth or seventh grade. Yeah. So that's probably what, that was my my beginning, and you know, and I was god awful, you know. My dad uh, just did not understand. I was going to ask. I mean, how, you know, parents <laughs> parents of drummers they've got to they've got to have a special nerve yeah, to be able to tolerate. Gonna, or they, ha- or they yeah. have to be gone a lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm a terrible drummer, by the way. And I, I put my mother through a lot of uh, listening to play the drums awfully. Yes, for years. I, she put up with it. it I don't know. How. Yeah, it, no, a parent really has to love you. To love yeah, you. <laughs> that's right. That is, that's for I sure. Mean, so I mean, you, you, you guys uh, came from Southern California, in the Bay Area, uh, yeah. South Bay. I mean, I mean, you were around uh, during this apex. Of of music of just you know we rock and roll jazz R and B when you yeah. when you started playing drums I mean this you had this atmosphere of just the greatest time oh yeah no I mean the music uh, it, it, our our era was f- fantastic fantastic for stimulus because I mean you know I mean you know you had Coltrane you right had, you know Miles Davis you had you know writers like Jackson Brown and all these am- amazing artists you had the you know the cl- classical i mean everything was uh available i mean it, it still is and i mean but you know we we had the first rush of it all coming together and and you know and the and the ethnic thing with Ravi Shankar and all right. that coming coming in so you know it was it was all new and wonderful now you know it wasn't samples on a keyboard you know now you know of course you it, it was you tape loops it, yeah <laughs> exactly and you had you had to really want it and you'd go out and you'd have to kind of live it to to uh, absorb it you know right and uh, it was it was a great time so and ambrosia really was i mean with the four characters that the original guys that we were you know we all had our 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 backgrounds and very diverse backgrounds from blues to jazz to classical to uh you know the pop songwriting to and it all came together to create that that you know very i thought it was a fairly unique blend of you know sounds coming from the characters in the band right it, it, you know it's, i i know that you've you've told that story about um the the guys looking your name up in a directory <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> yeah so there's a thing called the Musicians Contact Service, and and I think it's still there in Hollywood. Is that right? At the time, it was just this little, uh, you know, little you know room off of Sunset Boulevard, uh, and you would walk in, and there was a billboard, and, uh, and you tack your you know three by five card with your name and your number and what you played, and uh, and I you know I just did it one day, uh, you know. And the next thing I knew, you know, uh, these guys call me. Dave and Joe and Chris call me. And uh, they came to my place where I lived in Venice. I was the outsider. They lived in the San Pedro, Torrance, Lamida area. Which right. Is the port, port cities of Los, you know, Long Beach. And, and I, I was a little bit of the outsider. I lived in Venice. Uh, so they came over, and we really became a band in my living room before we even played a note, you know, just the enthusiasm of talking about what we were all interested in. And then our, I think we had our first jam session at Joe's parents' house, and the first song lasted like an hour and 45 minutes. Right. You know, it just, you know, it just never stopped. What, what, right. what, was, what was the initial sound like? I mean, what, what was the, I mean, the, 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 the feel when you guys started to just feel each other out on the instrument? Well, we, we, we just started with something simple, but you know uh, we were very influenced by, say, like Tony Williams' Lifetime, right, and and things like that. And of course, you know our first gigs uh, as a band, uh, you know, we we'd never make it more than one night because uh, you know they'd want a dance band, and we come in and you know, and we'd be good for like a couple minutes, and then all of a sudden it'd be it would become this, you know, um, Miles Davis, you know, outside jam thing and you know that was no one can dance minutes. to it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know and then it would be like uh, you know the people would be looking at us like uh what are you doing <laughs> right oh and, uh, yes 
so you know it was very meaningful for us but uh so but and then we had such we we would play the hollywood bowl uh we had these strange connections that would we played some modern classical thing at the hollywood bowl and then we the next night we'd be at the uh you know san pedro free clinic doing, right uh, you know it, it was it was a very eclectic band and you know, anything anything could happen, and anything was allowed to happen. And I, I I heard I heard that you um, when you guys got together, you you were, I mean, there was a few years you were playing shows, recording demos, and uh, some of the sound, uh, I guess, it was more of a say folky like a, a CSN kind of harmony yeah. kind of thing. And then, of course, the famous story is 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 seeing Kim King Crimson. Right and and yeah. how, what was that 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 how did you know how did that affect you guys? Well, yeah, it was overwhelming. I mean, yeah, I would say you know uh, the first uh, impetus of Ambrosia, and this is right as I was joining the band. Uh, you know, it was more of a country, um, you know, harmony based band. With the harmony still exists and never left, but uh, you know, it was you know folk folkish in a way, and then. Uh, they were driving down Sunset Strip, uh, the three of them, and they just, you know, passed the whiskey and this sign outside said King Crimson. Well, let's go see, and you know, and then that that warped them so completely that, uh, you know, we we were, we were changed band after that. Wow. I mean, how do you how do you approach that though? Is is if you are going from say regular song chord structure to uh, all right we're gonna have this part that's gonna be in this time signature and then we're gonna flip it and do this I, 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 did it just immediately well, just kind of like we we just started to you know think like that well yeah i mean uh well right then i entered the band and i was into this ethnic thing sure i was at ucla studying uh, uh african music and uh Ethio, you know and uh, persian rhythms and so I was bringing in all these beats, and um, and they were just very receptive to whatever I brought in. And then we would start writing to it, and then we'd we'd actually play games where we would sit in a circle and pick numbers and make you know uh, rhythmic progressions out of them. Is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah. It was just like um, yeah. I mean, we would try anything we could think of, you know, uh, to expand or or you know, alter our way of approaching music. The, so. the, the, you know what would be great is the, the, the Burley Drummond home game, where you, <laughs> you write songs and you put the cards out. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, you know, I mean, I mean, I think they actually have computers that... You know, <laughs> Do all the work for you. That now. Yeah, right, so... You um, know, I, one of the, I, I, I love this story, and uh, maybe you could touch up on this story, but the, the, the first record... That came out in '75, uh, and then the second record, uh, the first record mixed by Alan Parsons. Right. And well, you know, we when we played the Hollywood Bowl, t- we we during the, we got called one afternoon to demonstrate a sound system by a, a sound company we knew uh, that was auditioning their sound system. So we we went to the Hollywood Bowl, set up and auditioned their sound system, and the, a fellow there was a guy named Gordon Perry who was the chief recording engineer for London Decca Classical. Wow. <laughs> and he saw us, and he became our most avid fan. Is that right? I, I, we met every classical conductor, you know, that was prominent in the world at that time. Went to, you know, every classical concert. I mean, literally, we, we probably went to a hundred classical, you know, concerts at the Hollywood Bowl and Royce Hall, and then we ended up playing with some of the orchestras in modern uh, music contexts. And uh, so he was huge, and he came in one day, returned from England one day, and walked into the studio where we were recording. And goes, this is the man that has to mix your record, and then he played us "Dark Side of the Moon." Is that right? We, we had never heard it. Oh, jeez! It like, and it was just like, yeah, you know. So we get on the phone and we call Abbey Road. Just, just and, out of the blue, you just call. Yeah, Call Abbey Road and go hi. Uh, you know, Miss Alan Parsons there, and he <laughs> voice on the other line goes speaking. <laughs> is, is that right? Just just and answering the phones and and yeah. engineering <laughs> records. <laughs> the so guy does he, it all. Uh, 
he came over for a gram you know to for the grammy uh awards that year for uh, dark side of the moon he heard what we were doing he agreed to mix it came back over and mixed it and um and uh, you know then we got grammy nominations out of that that is so, amazing and then of course we, he co-produced the second one uh, somewhere I never traveled, and you know, and during the course of doing his, uh, our first album, we recorded uh, the Raven for his first album, sure. Tales of Mystery and Imagination. Great record. Yeah, but, you so. know, it, it, it's amazing what you you mentioned getting the Grammy nomination. What, how did that strike you? I mean, that's like a, a basically the industry kind of giving a nod to your record, and you, I mean, coming from. Uh, you know that uh, this is probably one of the b- bigger successes oh. up until that it, point. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, it was. I mean, to really come from nowhere and then, sure. you know, on your first album be nominated for I think it was three Grammys or something, two or three on the first record, and you know it was like it was almost, um, you know, a dream. Sure. I mean, it's like I mean, uh, what well, you know what what is that, what does this mean? <laughs> right. Does this just mean we're okay? Yes. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. But the first, yeah. the, the, I've heard from uh, record societies, you know, vinyl collectors that have these societies for sound, and they they rate recordings, recorded sound that supposedly our first album is considered, you know, the best or in the you know the top five best sounding pieces of vinyl. That you know were produced. That's a, you know I that's a, that. yeah that's a great that's a that. good that's a good uh, title to have. Yeah yeah totally. yeah. I mean it and I mean even that's you know that that surprised us like you know wow. Well there's a there's an incredible depth in the music you guys play I think. Oh, there's thanks. complexity to it. Yeah so I could see and that and also funny. just the the arrangements and yeah. the orchestration that's added. Uh, it's I mean it stands out. It is like you've said before the the kind of trying to. Uh, following the same footsteps of approach like the Beatles and using these different elements it's we- it's woven so neatly and that's I think that's what stands out about those records and and one of the things that I I noticed is uh when you guys you know you you had the following in you had the first big hit and then you you kind of followed up continuing into this uh, sort of the 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 hit making, if you will, and uh, well, actually there was a gap because um, our first record had holding on yesterday. Yes, and uh, top twenty. Yeah, that did very well. I mean, we'd be on tour, and you know, we'd go to radio stations where it was number one, and say something like one of these nights was number two, and you know, we were like flabbergasted. Mm-hmm. That's like, amazing. Wow, yeah, you right. know, it's like wow. I mean, you know, every market had a different thing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we were up and sometimes we were down, but um, but then you know we uh, we did somewhere I never traveled and you know we released a single off there I think think um, uh, shoot it was it was a rock tune um, anyway, uh, I should know this <laughs> as a professional uh, I should uh, know this can't can't let a woman I think was right it. I'm not yeah so you know and that that didn't happen as a single. So then, the, so there was a you know there was a little drought there until we had how much I feel is that yes, uh, That's, which was I think the next bona fide hit. How how long between those those? Well, you know I take it I take it back. We did a cover of Magical Mystery Tour. Right for the the, the that compilation yes. Yeah, so that kind of filled the gap, um, and then we then we had how much I feel, and then we you know during that time there was a big division between FM and AM radio. And we would go to the FM stations, and, you know, and they weren't too kind, you know, after we had How Much I Feel, because we were kind of, we kind of embraced us as, you know, America's uh, prog, um, uh, you know, thing, or or harder thing, Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden we had How Much I Feel, and some of them weren't too crazy about that, you know. Right. And uh, so it was a different time back then. you know, I mean, now when we play live, all that stuff works together. Exactly. It's like, you know, you can do time waits for no one and then go right into how much I feel and, and nobody bats an eye. It, 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 I think back then there must have been a lot of division with the, and scrutiny because it's two different yeah, genres. Exactly. So it's, yeah, I, I, and it's it's amazing to to think about the, um, you know, I, I don't know how, how you guys uh, as a unit trying to decide what music to present on your next records. 
And when you had the, when you had the, uh, the uh, how much I feel and you're the only woman, did you know that these, these songs have the potential to be these big hits? Well, yeah. I mean, you were, um, you were, you were hedging your bets that, yeah, right. that, you know, this song has, uh, you know, just from the crowd around you. And, but it's funny when we did 180, uh, with had, which had two hits on it, You're the Only Woman and Biggest Part of Me. Uh, you know, we were auditioning kind of engineer producers to do our thing, and none of them picked, you know, they all liked them, but they picked the, the more, they, I think the tune they can pick the most consistently to be the hit was uh, If Heaven Could Find Me, which, you know, never came close to, you know, being thought of a, as a hit record after we recorded it. So, right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just funny how, you know, people hear stuff. But, you know, we always kind of thought, yeah, no, biggest part of me, how much... I feel, you know, you're the only one. Those are going to be a kind of hit record. And, uh, I mean, in in retrospect, um, you know, which I don't know is worth looking at, is that, you know, in some senses those records, as good as they were, you know, kind of took us out of the arena and put us in, the, you know, more the, the not the nightclub, but the, con- you know, the smaller concert hall. Right. It's, it, so it, in a sense... Uh, you could say, well, it wasn't the smartest move to go that direction. It was, it was, it was a smart move for maybe the the publisher, sure. Maybe not, not so much for the band. So <laughs> right, right, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's hindsight. And and do we regret the songs? No, you know, we did them. We did them the best that we could. You know, and what else can you do? Sure. You know, so. Well, sometimes when you switch up something, right, then uh, it takes a little while for people to catch up and understand what you're doing. And yeah, that you're still exactly. essentially the same performer with the same talents and abilities, and still doing great work. And I and I think uh, to add to that, I also think that you know, in in hindsight, we, you know, as an artist, you're just doing things, putting them out there, and, sure. and not looking back. Right. So you kind of, you know, yeah. when you look back, then you're like, ah, oh, this is what we did. So yeah. you kind of have to, uh, you know, kind of look at things that way. I, you you guys did the the last record, Rhode Island. Yes. And and what what were you guys as you're going to the studio to record that record? Did you know that that was going to be the last record? No. You know what what happened was it was and that's a, that's a testament to timing. It's like there was a fella at Warner Brothers named Bob Regeer who was the catalyst for getting us over there from 20th Century Fox where we did our first two records. Right. And so you know he he had a dinner with us one time. And this was after Biggest Part of Me and all these hits. And he goes, hey, I didn't bring you over to uh, Warner Brothers to do, you know, to have pop hits. He goes, I wanted the, the you know, I wanted the juice. I wanted the, the, the uh, you know, the prog, you know, cre- you know, stuff that nobody else can do. Right. No. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> What you know? It's like why did you wait? Well, you know, four years to tell us. <laughs> now, now we got all these hits. Now what do we do? Yeah. yeah. So then, so you know, we as a band go well, okay. Let's go back there. That'd be you know that's where uh, you know our first love affair was. Sure. So let's let's go. And that's so. Rhode Island for us was a bit of a return to the Prague thing that we started at. You know, and during but during the <laughs> this is what's so funny about record companies. During the course of doing that record, Bob Regeer passes away. Oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. So, so we finished the record, we hand it in, and Warner Brothers goes, what's this? Oh, no. Yeah, and it's kind of like, well, you know. <laughs> so right. it's kind of like, yeah. yeah. I mean, even though we, I think we had a commercial, so, you know, very, so a couple of very commercial tunes, like How Can You Love Me. I sure. It should have been, you know. But, uh, you know, you, I mean, the chances... You know, of of writing a hit, recording it right, and having the record company promote it right, man, that's a lot of chances. Oh like yes, that. that's have, yeah, that's like going to, to Reno for the weekend. Yes, yes. I mean, a lot of things have to fall in line, and and uh, and our you know our management wasn't together, and it's like you really you really need you really need somebody that can ride the ride the train and conduct the train, and you know really know what to do and you know we were kind of um, you know I had odds with our manager at the time who you know kind of owned everything and so it wasn't the best time for Ambrosia and it, and it kind of uh, we had horrible deals that we had signed and so 
it, it was kind of um, not a great time for the individuals. In sure. Japan. And so uh, we took a break after uh, Rhode Island, and then I think we were, you know, quiet for about, Dave went on and did a solo record. Right. And um, I think that had kind of marginal success on his end. So, you know, he then he was anxious to put the band back together. Uh, and, you know, so we slowly started getting back together. Joe was out with Bruce Hornsby. Right. I was going to ask you, Joe yeah. was doing that. What, was Bruce Hornsby, did he play as as part of the, the stage yeah. band for a while? Yeah, he played. Uh, I'm not sure he did many shows. He might might have done a handful of shows. Sure. Us, but, but he was in the band about six months toward the end because, yeah, it was just. Yeah, just going in that direction. And what yeah. when you guys, I guess, discontinued uh, playing and uh, started working on different projects. Um, how long did that 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 period last before you guys decided to get back together in the nineties? Yeah, about seven eight years. I think. Yeah. And then, uh, but you know, it it had to happen. And sure, it was, gr- it was great. I mean, because you know, I was. I I got I I got a family you know started a family found my wife and you know and and cleaned up a lot of bad things you know <laughs> that had accrued during the uh, just just you know, just wiping yeah. the eighties off yeah, of yeah. it <laughs> yeah just wiping like, that's that's, yeah, a great that's pretty good I'm wiping the eighties off yeah, yeah. exactly totally. you can use but, that uh, that's that's copyright <laughs> free so <laughs> but that's you know and so now uh, after all is said and done. Uh, no, well, we came back and we put a, a greatest hits package together with a couple of new songs, and uh, and then it wasn't really working out uh, with Dave at the time. Uh, he was, um, you know, starting to produce a lot. Sure. And so and so he, you know, we'd have shows and he'd be backing out, and that you know that would kind of create havoc out there because we're. You know, what do you do on on the road when you you got a you're missing a member? Right. So you know we were having subs for him and things like that, and. You know, but then again, that's kind of false advertising. You know, sure. you tell, you know, especially when he'd say he'd be there and then he wouldn't be there, and then it's like, well, that doesn't look good. So, uh, so eventually, it was just better for him to go do his thing and for us to do our thing. Right. And uh, it eased a lot of tensions. And now, you know, now the band is just just a big happy family, and we're having fun. And um, it seems. Yeah, we, it, it, Seems like you guys are really, you know, on the on these shows, you're really having a blast playing, and uh, you sound sound great. And and oh. I was going to ask you, I mean, you you've even so much. You were on uh, Jimmy Fallon a couple years back, yeah. And it's just it, it, the enthusiasm for the group is is it seems like it's growing and and yeah. and continuing. Yeah, uh, it it is. I mean, we're getting great receptions, and what's really cool is, I mean, the uh, I mean the respect that we get when we play, and you know, with like on the Jimmy Fallon show. I mean, you know, the the roots were, you know, holding us in reverence, and it was kind of like, you know, <laughs> we have that feeling about them. So yes. It's like, um, and did, did you get to play drums on Crest Love? Whenever we do play, we'll have like a you'll see some young group sitting on the side of the stage, you know, you know, checking it all out. Sure. Cool. So that is, yeah, I mean, it's it's it seems. It's, uh, it just seems like a, such a uh, a great uh, time. I mean, yeah. you know, and it, what it, what is really exciting though is to think about it. I mean, if you, if you thought back when you were just a kid, when you were you meeting Joe and and the rest of the guys for the first time, to look ahead forty some odd years later, you're still you know still at it and still having such a effect on 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 a lot of people is it's yeah. got to be a tremendous feeling. Yeah. It, it is. It is. I mean, it's an honor. It's an honor to be able to do what we do, and and uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it. It's fantastic. You know, let me ask you. You you you've you've um, you've been you've put out some records uh, uh, for other artists, and uh, you've you've got your own, um, I guess, uh, like a studio as well as a label that you kind of put out indie artists. Yes. Uh, do you, can you t- tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, okay, I mean, I was really lucky uh, after, I mean, I learned a lot with Ambrosia, uh, an awful lot about songwriting and and recording and producing. Uh, And then uh, during that interim that we were were quiet, you know, I I got asked by the Lost Dogs 
which is like an alt. It's like the traveling Wilburys of the alternative Christian market. Right. Okay. And, you know, it's like the you know, 77s, Adam again. You know, people, you know, that, you know, you have to be into that, but they were uh, some of the most amazing writers I ever experienced. Terry sure. Taylor and uh, uh, Gene Eugene. And, uh, so I did I did all their records, and I learned a whole lot from a guy named Gene Eugene about how to make records, and um, and he was brilliant. And so then I started my wife and I started a, a band called Tin Drum, and we built a studio uh, where in our you know our our garage is one big studio, and so um, we built it just to record ourselves. But then people would hear our records and start asking us to do. You know, can we help them? So then we started producing other people's records, and then we became a small label, you know, trying to help the, promote the records that we produce. Right. And then, uh, you know, I, you know, artists, some pretty varied artists. Like, um, one is I'm especially proud of is a guy named Mighty Mo Rogers. Sure. I've, I, I, was I was listening to some tracks earlier that uh, I, I guess, have you been... You performing with him as well is that right yeah yeah i go to europe a lot with him or canada uh, he's very big in canada and in europe and uh to me he's as profound an artist as, as i've ever witnessed he's he's amazing so it's it you know every day out here it's, it's two or three every day in my studio is like two or three different projects and uh it's it's very fulfilling and uh and it keep it keeps me on top of my playing and producing and because you know there's so much, you know, there's so much variety. And right. Could, from from you know a, a, a bebop album to you know Mighty Mo Rogers with existential blues to uh, you know spoken word to a children's album to you you name it and it's all wonderful. It, it sounds you know and I I was looking at the the your website um, at the Tin Drum Music dot com. Which needs some attention, but thank you. Yeah, it's. It, but it, it, I was just no marveling at the just the the, the specs for the oh. for the studio, and uh, you know, great. Obviously, you've got a, a lot of uh, drums and equipment there, and it just seems very uh, inviting for musicians to come and record. And uh, it, 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 yeah, thank you. It, it, it's very it's very comfortable. In fact, this room for some reason I'm standing in the room. Oh yeah. Uh, Are you recording this? Because if you if you need a copy, I've got one. <laughs> oh, thanks. But uh, you know, the everybody shoots a video in this room. This must there must be forty videos that have been shot in this room. Is that right? Yeah, I, there's something about this room that people want to you know document themselves in it. So it looks it probably looks like a recording studio. You know, like the the the, the, uh, the quintessential the quintessential look. Yeah. It's, well, it's yeah. It's you know it's stuffed to the rafters. Sure. Instruments falling off of shelves and everything, and but for some reason it works. So <laughs> I'm not going to fight it. I, I if I if I can do it, I'll I try to book some time there just to, <laughs> okay. just to get in there. Let me I you know I, I don't want to keep you on for 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 too long. I just wanted to ask you what what a you know you're recording a lot of other people's music playing. Um, you know, it's traveling and doing this. What is there any music that you are listening to these days that you that really uh, is keeping your interest and in, in, in kind of inspiring you? Well, um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, yes, I mean everything inspires me. Sure. Uh, um, I I have I've kind of you know uh, over the years of being a drum addict, you know a drum junkie, whatever you want to say, or a rhythmic rhythm junkie, uh, I have, I've just happened upon some um, in, insights into playing that I want to pursue and to transfer that into, uh, into music, you know, uh, make, in, into writing around certain concepts that I have in mind. You know, wh uh, I, I don't know if I can pinpoint where they came from. It's just uh, the continual... Uh, study of playing and absorbing uh, the yeah yeah, uh, but I have some definite ideas and uh, I promised my wife uh, who plays in Ambrosia now she's the keyboard player uh, one of the key one of the two keyboard players for Ambrosia uh, and she also she does uh, a lot of the the, the uh, harmonies yeah, as well she's, yeah she's probably the glue in the harmony because that she's exceptionally good at it so um, you know, I promised her that we'd do another record. So I, you know, and and I'm playing now with Bill Chaplin and people like that. 
so there's a, there's like five projects I need to write for. So I need to I need to writing is something I have to make myself sit down and initially do because mm-hmm. if, if I walk into a room and there's a keyboard and there's a drum set. I'll go straight to the drum set because it's just... It's just you know, second yeah. second nature. Yeah, it's like, I, you know. Uh, so, but I have to... I, I, once I start writing, I'm fine, but I have to make myself start. Right. And, and it yeah. sounds like you, you've, you've got a lot of uh, projects and, 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 and staying so busy. It's... it's I, I'm 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 really happy for you guys and uh, oh, for you thanks. for you personally and and I I just and also I'm I'm just so glad that you guys are keeping keeping both sides of the Ambrosia alive and oh, uh, thanks. without yeah. a doubt and and Burley I gotta I just want to also thank you so much uh, for 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 joining us uh, today oh. and and spending so much time with us talking about the group and yeah, really uh, appreciate it. Yeah, we really okay, do. Thank, thank both of you. It's an honor, and I, I really appreciate you know your interest in Ambrosia. Oh, definitely. So and and uh, just to, and to let the audience know, you guys are playing. You said Saturday, uh, August thirtieth at the Levitt Pavilion in Arlington, Texas. Yes. And then uh, House of Blues, San Diego, Friday, September twelfth, and then the next night, uh, the thirteenth in Anaheim. You're right, House of Blues in Anaheim. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm. Uh, if you guys, you guys have any plans to come up to the Bay Area? Man, we would love it. We would love it. I, San, my San Francisco is one of my favorite places in the world. So. Well, I, you know what? If you, I, I let me know. I, I, I will be there, front and center, testing, testing your security to see if, I, <laughs> see if I get thrown out. <laughs> but I will be there, baby. I, I, you know what? I got, I gotta say, Burley. I, I, once again, thank you again for for taking the time. And the the website is ambrosialive dot net. Yes. That is great. Well, I, I, you know, I, we hope to have you on on the program sometime soon. I hope so too. Thank you so. Thank much. you so much, Burley Drummond. Thank you. All right. Take care, baby. Wow. How about that? What an exceptional human being. What a great guy. Uh, What an honor to have him on the program.